So uh, we're here at uh, Le Web, uh, London, here with uh, Jeff Clavier. So um, why are you here in Le Web? Um, two things. One is uh, it's always interesting to attend Le Web because that's now the event where all the European entrepreneurs sort of gather. And even though SoftTech mainly invest in the US, it's a great way for us to uh, tap into the ecosystem and see what's going on and meet you know, our fellow entrepreneur uh, from Europe. Uh, fellow entrepreneurs from Europe. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm also a great friend of Loïc and that's my ninth Le Web. Um, and so it's a tradition for me to always speak at Le Web, you know, every edition. So why does Le Web work that way? How how how's it? Uh, I mean, successful, right? It's been very successful. It's now by far uh, the largest uh, tech event in in Europe, and I think one of the largest tech events in the world. It's this unique combination um, of amazing speakers. Um, Great interviewers, uh, really high quality content, uh, a lot of you know snappy agenda. Where if you look at the number of panels and talks and demos over the two day period, it's just like nonstop for hours and hours. And I think that because of this magnet that the web has become, people just say, well, if I want to know what's going on, if I want to meet people in the ecosystem, I'm just going to attend the conference. And that's why for the first year of the web in London. Um, you know, we sold out at 1,300 or 1,400 people, and I guess Le Web Paris uh, will be, you know, the biggest again because every year, you know, it's been bigger and bigger and bigger, and so I don't know, we'll have 3,500, 4,000 people, something like that. So you have a French accent, right? I do. And I do. Uh, since when do you live in the uh, USA? Um, I moved to the US in 2000, so it's been 12 years. And uh, even though I'm, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, I haven't lost the French accent now. And uh, so, what would you recommend uh, the new government in France to to do to uh, take advantage of technology and uh, fix the world? Well, unfortunately, what I'm going to say is not in their motto. Um, they have to do what they can to support startups, and to support startups in France, uh, you have to basically have the flexibility of employment. So. Um, hire easily, fire more easily because it's too difficult for people to uh, scale and, and, and descale in France uh, because of the environment. And so, um, if ever entrepreneurs have the choice, uh, they will move away from France and come to London. And London is, I think, the fifth or sixth largest city for French people, you know, given the, the size of the community here. And it's, it's kind of a shame because French engineers are extremely good. Uh, you know, I've, I was a CTO myself in my previous life, and my, my teams were excellent. But unfortunately, it's just very hard to build and scale companies in France. And so, um, at the but end it, of the day... It has been like that for the last five, ten years, while well, the previous government was there, no? It, or was it good? It's been... Well, they tried to introduce um, a lot more flexibility, and, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was sort of going there. Um, unfortunately, with all the... Um, you know, the, the challenge that the French have is that it's dirty to make money. And unfortunately, in the startup world, if you're successful, you're gonna make a lot of money and, you know, this crazy 75% tax, uh, tax rate is just insane. I mean, they just, it's a, it's a message to um, entrepreneurs that they should go build, you know, their companies somewhere else, because by definition, um, if, you're, if you're really successful with startups, uh, you'll, make a, you'll make a ton of money. And, and that's good because that, you know, that's money you can put back into the economy. And so I think it's, uh, it's a shame that um, uh, they're thinking about it that way. So let, let's walk uh, a little bit over there inside. Uh, so, so I checked a little bit uh, your portfolio on the internet, yes. and so there's lots, lots of things. How do you how do you manage? So we've made about 126 investments in the last eight years. Uh, our pace is roughly. Uh, 20 to 20 investments a year. Uh, we do invest out of a $55 million seed fund, uh, which is one of the largest in the US. And what we do is uh, we try and select entrepreneurs uh, with uh, differentiated ideas and with a, what we consider be, uh, being a big market opportunity. And we sort of help them um, building up the company, getting their financing, executing on the product side, on the marketing side. And essentially, we, we're sort of a, um, an extended part of the team. 
uh, where you know we pull our own resources to support the companies, and um, we've managed to um, to scale. Even though we, we only have a uh, three-person team uh, on the investment side, uh, we can support a portfolio of about 80 active portfolio companies um, with without too much stretch. Of course, we work a lot, but that's fine. I mean, that's what we do. Um, and we really try and add as much value as we can, uh, especially to the um, uh, very early stage companies which have raised you know, some seed financing from us and will go and spend about 18 months um, in the trenches building the product, releasing it, getting you know, the initial user base or plan base until we actually go and raise money from other VCs, uh, four, six, eight million, and then at that time, you know, we'll sort of hand over the keys of the company to uh, the partners of the WC firm. That's why we really try and work only with the best firms, with the best partners uh, that can actually do their job and, and help scale the company. And uh, it's been working really well for us. So is, your, is part of your plan also to have comp companies that compete with Google, with Facebook, and they become huge, or how, how do you, well, what kind of vision do you have? So we are investors in Bleco, which is the third largest you know, search engine in the US now. Um, and yes, they compete with Google because they're in the search uh, market, but they don't compete head to head you know, with Google. Like There are certain sort of use cases for you to use Bleco, and otherwise you sort of use Google. I think for us the, the question is always how big of an opportunity can we get to if ever the company sort of works and sometimes you will go ahead and compete uh, with some of the uh, existing companies. Competing with Facebook doesn't make any sense because they're very recent but competing with other, you know, uh, Web 1.0 companies, yes absolutely. Uh, that's, that's essentially the revival of a lot of business models and opportunities from Web 1.0, some of which fail, but with you know Facebook and a billion smartphones out there, you can actually make th those things work on a much much reduced you know cost, and therefore um, we just we just look at those opportunities individually, trying to figure out what makes sense. Um, we prefer the brand new opportunities, but sometimes it's a matter of saying, well, we can disrupt. This but your um, you know uh, industry leader and uh, we take a shot at it. So uh, you in Silicon Valley, right? And uh, is that where all the developers, the best developers, are? I mean, it's a big deal about getting the developers into the startups and making. I mean, they do all the work, no? Somehow. Well, it's developers, but it's also designers. It's also marketing people. I mean, what's interesting is that over the past few years, you know, technology has been important. That's for sure. But uh, design and marketing have become also really prominent uh, reasons for companies to be successful. And so, yes, in Silicon Valley you have a concentration of you know, talent, but there's also such a, an oversupply of capital and a vast number of companies that it's actually very, very um, challenging to hire talent over there. And so I would say now we build companies on a much more global basis where it's not uncommon to have um, sales, marketing, CEO in the valley and then developers somewhere else, you know, uh, whether it's in, somewhere else in the US, somewhere in Argentina, somewhere in you know, Ukraine, uh, somewhere in, uh, uh, what do we have in the portfolio, uh, somewhere in London, it's, you have to sort of be f flexible and go where the talent is. Is that your, your talent, to find the talent, put them together? Well, the, the talent that we find is, you know, the the, the, the co-founders, uh, the the, uh, the founders that we work with. The challenge for us is that we see, you know, several thousand opportunities a year, and we invest in twenty. Right? Finding talent is unfortunately. I mean, yes, we will help finding senior talent, but developers, unfortunately, we don't we don't have this untapped, you know, resource uh, that we can, you know, get into. Uh, to find developers, it's uh, it's a real challenge for companies. So that's why the one the one feedback we give our founders is that they have to be flexible as to where they're going to get you know their talent from. And looking for developers only in San Francisco is unfortunately not uh, the only solution. The salary for a developer, a good developer, is quite high, no? Yes. How high is it? Is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. I mean, it's, um, it really depends as to their specific uh, skill set. But if you look for 
um, an experienced um, iOS developer who has been around, you know, the market for four or five years or whatever, you're going to pay, you know, between 150 and 200, you know, grand uh, to them. And that's because, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all the established players plus the well-funded startups are going to try and get those guys. And so that's why early stage startups, which have a hard time uh, paying those kinds of salaries because they don't have you know, funding for that, uh, will have to find either people who are much more interested in the equity part of their compensation package, or they will have to go and find people sort of somewhere else. So the developer comes and gets a few percent of the company? Um, they get a portion of the company. Or less than yes. one percent, so it depends. It depends, it depends. And they could be interested in the opportunity there? Well, you know, it's if you're if you manage to join a, a company which is about to be priced in the mid, you know, mid single digit valuation, and you're onto something which is actually scaling very very fast, the value of that equity is so much more, so much greater than any salary that this is really what um, what you want to shoot for, and that's what that's why you have developers who are really good at. You know, sort of sensing which companies have opportunity, joining them, spending two, three years, and then moving to the next one. And those are sort of the, the guys who build the core of the product and and create this sort of core of the engineering team that they can then leave if ever they decide to do so. And some actually stick around for a while. So with Moore's Law, this exponential growth in technology, the advances, is it the same in terms of ideas, more and more ideas every day, more and more? There's certainly been, an you know, I've been, I've been doing this gig for eight years now, and I've been an investor for 12 years. It's insane, the rate of, I mean, the growth of the um, uh, startup market has been pretty crazy over the past year or so, where we just, inundated with opportunities to invest. Not everything is good, to be honest. Uh, a lot of Me Too's, a lot of uh, things which we just don't, we just aren't interested in. Like, so many photo sharing things. Okay, yes, I know Instagram got a billion dollars, who cares? I mean, it's, it's, it's an exception, and, and, and the two co-founders were extremely talented, and I wish I had invested. But, you know, we really want to see um, brand new approaches and things which can yield interesting differentiated companies like in in Europe uh, recently we've invested uh, co-leading around at a company called Farmaround. Uh, Farmaround is uh, based in Croatia and they are building an ERP, a cloud-based ERP for the farming world which is a gigantic opportunity that no one even remotely thinks about because who wants to build you know software to manage cows or you know crops well those guys do and we're super excited to be involved in this um, in this thing because it was definitely brand new with a uh, very interesting approach and guys who have a passion for farming and so we try to find those kinds of opportunities because we think that they can yield the, the most interesting uh, companies at the end of the day and also um, we're much more bullish on things which have a direct business model, whether it's going to be e-commerce, whether it's going to be transaction, whether it's going to be, uh, you know, SaaS, whether any of those sort of direct models is interesting to us. Uh, media we still invest in, or media models we still invest in, but it's much tougher. All right, so looking forward to uh, crazy things in the future. Well, crazy or, you know, disruptive or real, you know, every day, we wake up and we know that there's going to be something interesting exposed to us and we have to sort of make, or, make up our mind very quickly as to whether this is something we want to get involved in, but it's certainly been a, an interesting ride.